Hi there, I'm Felix. You are watching the lecture series on evolution presented by Central University of Punjab, Bhatinda, India. In the last lecture, we have laid foundation to the evolutionary thought and discussed philosophical developments through Darwinism and beyond. In this class, we are going to discuss about evidences for evolution. If you have missed the last class, view it from the course website. So, fossil evidence and biogeography that provides a lot of evidence for the evolution. Then comes, you must already be knowing what these homologous and analogous structures are, right? And if you observe these structures either in uh, ex extinct animals in fossil record or extant current living organisms, you will know that the process is very clear, okay? Then vestigial structures. We have some of these vestigial structures like appendix, you know, or wisdom tooth, right? or tonsils or some are a little bit tricky is it really vestigial or not for example nipples for man okay is it vestigial or is it something else of course i don't think it is a vestigial though okay so well there are these structures if you look at those structures and function of those structures then again the, uh, the process of evolution becomes a lot more clearer then embryology that i have explained already that evo divo concept or recapitulation theory of heckel ernst heckel Right? So the embryological development is exactly like what is happening in uh, uh, the evolution, process of evolution. Then if you look at the molecular level, most of these enzyme sequences are much conserved. For example, cytochrome C oxidase, okay, Cox gene are much conserved across all of this animal kingdom. And DNA polymerase, for example, if you look at the protein sequence of DNA polymerase, not much difference is there from human being and uh, you know for example chimpanzee or even bacterial polymerase and uh, you know pro eukaryotic pro polymerase are almost similar albeit few differences that is that makes it different right then we will see some of this micro evolution in action so how this evolution is happening uh, currently looking at the, the, the evolution okay so looking at the evolution happening in our current world or in the last 100 years in this century or in the last century so that sets as a proof that the evolution is happening just like what observed uh, you know what darwin observed in galapagos the finches the big size of finch there is a direct proof that the evolution is happening right so well before that age of earth there is another main controversy in uh, last 300 400 years that many people fail to understand how old the earth is right and you know the 19th century uh, scientists were debating about this uh, age of earth uh, charles darwin you know he in his uh, tour on the chemist beagle he was looking at many geological formations and he thought it's really really immensely old than what the christianity was saying but in fact in hinduism uh, you know the earth itself is quite old right or portray a lot more accurate figure than what the Christian philosophy is uh, portraying. Now, uh, Darwin, after he came back from the trip, so he just wanted to see really how old the earth is. He was perplexed with the age of earth. And I already told you about uniformitarianism, okay, and gradualism, right? Uh, and these things influenced Darwin. You know, the Darwin was actually a geologist before he began his tour. He was trained as a geologist. Okay? So after coming back from the trip in England, so Darwin, after appreciating the uniformitarianism, he set out to see the age of Earth. He wanted to measure in empirically what the age of Earth is. So what he found is that this place called Weald in uh, west of England. So there is a, uh, you know, there's a river, Weald River there. So what he found is that sedimentation, rate of sedimentation, he counted how much sedimentation happens in one year or five years, what is the rate of sedimentation. So he could backtrace till now what, what would have been the sedimentation rate because the uh, forces of nature happening at current rate is same forever. That is what the uniformitarianism, right? And it happens very gradually. So taking cues from those two theories, uh, Hutton and Lyell's theory, so uh, Darwin calculated the age of this field and age of earth from the sediment accumulation of this uh, place in England, which he found it is 300 million years. 
of course that is quite flawed okay so there are so many uh, mistakes in his uh, uh, measurement but still you know it was quite a remarkable achievement what darwin made that it is really old than 5000 or 6000 as per the bible says right but at the same time the contemporary of the darwin william thomson later known as lord kelvin the the person behind the you know absolute zero the kelvin okay and uh, everything about the temperature this physicist is credited for okay so this kelvin uh what he found is that he measured in a temperature way right so earth what he found is something like a molten iron okay it's a solid molten iron so how long does a solid molten iron takes to cool down so molten means of course is immensely hot right so it gradually cools down to the present temperature around 25 degrees celsius so how long will it take so it is proportional to the size of earth so by the time of kelvin we already know the size of earth so he can simply proportionately he can calculate the time required for the surface temperature to come down to the current temperature surface temperature so he calculated that and he found that it is only 20 million years okay so there is actually a lot of flaws in his calculations as well that he thought it's solid while in fact earth is not really solid the molten core of earth is always in dynamic fashion and it's not simply sphere right it's oblongate sphere spherical oblongate structure the earth is having so the, there are certain uh, problems with kelvin's calculation as well but at the end of uh, uh, 19th century or the beginning of 20th century so the carbon dating that's a very important and very powerful tool that have been uh, uh, you know uh, adopted in the geologist spheres as well and the radiocarbon dating have revealed exactly it is 4.5 uh, 68 billion years old so this is the currently accepted age of earth that is 4.568 billion it's really old right now you know what these fossils are right fossils are nothing but the evidence of life right <coughs> and this is one of the strongest evidence for the evolution okay and uh, of course not all uh corpses or dead animals or dead plants fossilize right fossilization it's only a very very tiny fraction of uh you know corpses normally gets fossilized right so what it is it's filling after uh, fossilization is nothing but filling tiny spaces between the lattice work of bone and shells with new minerals so bone and shells shells of some other animal for example arthropod okay or a gastropod right so this shells and bone all these areas gets weathered and serially this gets filled with mineral depositions and these minerals can change it from one one type of mineral to calciferous mineral to carboniferous minerals different different mineralization serious serial mineralization of those body parts okay so that is what this exactly the fossilization means okay so sediment surrounding this mineral so the fossil as such is all mineral okay or carbon carboniferous okay so of course the whatever it is surrounding is all sediments right fine sediment normally first at first uh, during the formation of fossil it's all fine sediment like sand sand is a very fine sediment right but as as the you know time goes by these sediments become hardened so it it becomes ultimately rock so fossils are always found inside the rock so you will have to cut open the rock to see the fossils there okay and finally after millions of years these rocks it can upwell because of many of these geological processes okay upwelling of the rocks happen because for example uh, uh tectonic plates right the movement of tectonic plates can uh, uh, result in upwelling of this uh, geological i mean uh, under underground geological structures you might have seen that in uh, tv came out quite lately one month back after the earthquake in pakistan yeah you might have seen that one enter a new island have formed it so this is a brand new island and you can see that these are all finely preserved fossilized structures so during those time i mean these are the best uh, places uh, or the you know the paradise for 
paleontologists to go there and observe what are these preserved uh, remnants of the past are okay so after millions of years rock might be lifted and exposing the fossil and it's very immediate once a fossil is exposed it gets weathered so you have that is a final phase the rock and fossil weather or erode away right so geologists or paleontologists have only very very uh, you know short span of time to study this fossil between these two things once it has to go up and then it will soon become eroded so in the in the fraction of time of course that is not that very because the geological time scale is quite huge okay so it could be hundreds of years it will take for this weathering takes place rock weathering is uh, you know it is very very slow process you must be knowing it so between these frames that the paleontologists collect and study the fossils you know right well there are uh, basically there are three types of fossils so if if i say fossil something coming to your mind i suppose that is something called body fossils where the body or the anatomical features of the uh, plants or animals you can study directly from that kind of fossil okay so there is what these are elements of original body of ancient organisms could be bones shells or teeth okay it could also have some carbon or cell in fact right so that you can take up for example mammoth woolly mammoth so you can take out the dna from that preserved cells yeah? and then uh, you can sequence the dna and you can even try to clone it that is what some of these uh, uh, people in smithsonian is currently doing okay? so that is what it is body fossils okay now what are these trace fossils these are trace structures recording activity of ancient organisms so these are some of this uh, evidence of uh, the the previous organism but that is not really the structure okay the body structure it's not a body structure for example footprints okay so if you walk on a beach right or uh, on the banks of a river sandy banks of the river you know your footprints are there right so if something happened uh, very suddenly that these footprints are immobilized or some uh, uh, sandstorm happens and this this became fossilized so you can study those right those footprints to footprints could be a fossil in fact and that kind of fossil is what you call the trace fossil okay footprint fossil so there are other types as well for example burrows tooth marks okay root marks okay coprolites eggshells these are some of the examples of it the last slide right types of fossils so i told you what the body fossils are these are the normal fossils right then something called trace fossil it could be footprints or see this is tooth mark is very important that fossilized hominids they did a lot of analysis on uh, hominids hominids are our closest relatives okay most are now extinct for example can you name many hominid famous hominids homo neanderthalensis mm -hmm or homo erectus so many of this homo right so uh, looking at that homo neanderthalensis for example the fossils they have seen many of these bite marks of the carnivorous animals so those days uh, you know uh, our closest relatives right they have suffered a lot of attacks from carnivorous animals so that is what this this believe, this reveals kind of behavior okay the kind of ecological niche in those days so that is what these fossils are very important it's not just uh, the relation between the uh, organism will be revealed it could also reveal some behavioral patterns of that ancient uh, planet earth right so again uh, root marks right and eggshells all these are some of these trace uh, fossils now looking at the chemical fossils or biomarker the biomarker as such it could be uh, you know in medicine we know what these biomarkers are right so these are something like a, a, a signature that will reveal association with the disease for example cancer biomarker and all but here in this uh, uh, paleontology context biomarkers are relics of biogenic organic compound that may be detected geochemically in rocks one good example for this is something called okinane Okay, so okinane is a, of course that is an aliphatic organic molecule. 
that right now that is seen only in uh, uh, purple sulfur bacteria okay and purple sulfur bacteria right now it is very hard to find this kind of uh, archaea bacteria except in uh, hydrothermal vents where sulfur content is very high but if you look at that uh, geological formations in australia okay and um, the, there are several sites in australia for example north pole is a place in australia it's not really north pole okay australia is in southern hemisphere you know this place is full of this sort of uh, uh, you know geological of course the fossils these are not really fossil but these are rocks where okinin concentration is very high and that means that this is of course this is immensely old the rocks are very old and that means that during that time the old that is almost 1.6 billion years old rocks okay and during those time our planet was full of purple sulfur bacteria that is a that is a, a revealing right that that kind of atmosphere right and again that also means that if the purple sulfur bacteria colonizes our entire planet at that time 1.6 billion years ago that also means that uh, you know it is highly hospitable condition prevailing in that days it's full of sulfur and it is anoxic environment and the temperature was immensely hot and that is how the normal habitat of purple sulfur bacteria is. So this okinane is a, a signature molecule or biomarker for purple sulfur bacteria. So if you find this okinane, so that means that this is that old. Is that clear? So sponge compound or isotopically enriched carbon are some of the other examples of uh, this, uh, you know, uh, chemical fossils or biomarkers. Okay. So these five modes of fossilization is also quite important how fossil uh, how uh, a corpse can get fossilized okay so one is unaltered fossilization where nothing happens it's simple burial and uh, some weathering can happen so this sort of uh, thing mostly happens in pore okay north pole or south pole and uh, organism can simply get trapped inside a uh, uh, you know uh, ice and it never weathers Okay, so you can simply take it back and even you can sequence the DNA out of it. The tissues are preserved in. That is what this simple burial or unaltered is. Then per mineralized is nothing but mineral, right? The body parts are dissolved and the minerals are replaced in the body parts, right? Uh, dissolved minerals precipitate in pore space seen in many vertebrate fossils. So that is what it all gets mineralized. Now, what is this recrystallization means? Calcite crystals reorder and grow into each other. Original mineralogy remains, but the structure is lost. So, whatever the mineral, the original mineralogy means here, per mineralized, right? Whatever the mineral uh, formation of the structure, for example, femur bonds, okay? So, that becomes totally mineralized, right? Now, these are now changed to some other mineralized form. For example, calcite crystal. So, that grows into each other. While some remnants of the original mineral deposit can be there as well. So, that is what you call the recrystallization. What is this replacement? Partial or complete replacement of crystals of one mineral with another. It could include silification. So, silification means silica right the whatever the original mineral is is fully uh, changed with the silica mineral right then uh, it could be pyritization or phosphatization okay phosphate or pyrates so those could be there right it could form that as well so that is basically a replacement of mineral form with another mineral form now comes carbonization carbon film left in place of tissues this may preserve outlines of soft parts seen in some Langerstatin deposits. Okay, so the, uh, this film of carbon that is mainly because of what microbial film, right? Biofilms formed by microorganisms, especially cyanobacteria, right? So these films comes one after one, one after one to to uh, you know to form many structures, something like uh, straminopiles. Okay, so this sort of fossils are formed by the deposition of the biofilms so these are mainly bacterial biofilms or cyanobacterial biofilms okay so these are nothing but carbon biofilms are only carbon right so because these are organic compounds of the bacteria so it could preserve the outlines of soft parts 
so that's very important soft part in the sense muscle or ligaments even these are preserved in this kind of carboniferous or carbonized fossils okay so there is what you call lagerstatten there is a, a german word okay we will come to that later now what is this preservation bias not all these fossils are preserved in similar fashion okay and there are several factors affecting the preservation of the fossils factors such as uh, hard parts preserve more easily than the soft parts so that is a common attribute of all fossils a hard part for example skull or bone can easily be preserved than the soft parts such as muscle or tendons or ligaments okay and hard parts could also include enamel okay, or even feather or uh, you know th those keratinous substances right now marine environment the environment where the fossilization happens that is also a very important factor in marine environment it preserve a lot more easier than the terrestrial environment because because of uh, several factors if an organism gets sinked in inside the ocean floor you know the biodiversity or is quite low there right and uh, it's a bit harsh there not every organisms can able to scavenge uh, dead bodies sink down deep inside the uh, you know ocean floor and especially this is something like akin to pickling process you know ocean water you know it is uh, sodium chloride is quite high salt is quite high and that is a, a form of preservation in our common house right you are simply putting your whatever the pickled vegetable in the brine to uh, you know to preserve it for a longer time so that is exactly happening in the marine uh, environments okay while the terrestrial environments are prone to early erosion because of the lack of whatever the attributes the marine environment is having in the terrestrial the salt is not there and it's uh, oxic while underwater is mostly anoxic and also it is photic terrestrial is a lot of light you can see but uh, deep inside the abysmal ocean floor it is all dark right now other factors could be post-mortem transport and fragmentation and energy level all these matters energy level means trophic level so is it in which trophic level the organism belongs to so that also contributes in the uh, you know preservation also the post-mortem so just after death has it been transported to another field in that case then of course some of this uh, remnants of the body shape could have been lost right then biological activity for example predators or scavengers and these are always negatively hampering right if there are some hyena for example some scavengers that is eating the flesh out of mammoth then you know even if after after fo immediate fossilization the mammoth fossils could not be that good because of the scavenging many of the body parts might already have been eaten by uh, scavengers or even decomposers right water chemistry for example oxygen level at burial site and impact on biological activity so in generally in uh, you know speaking generally oxygen level is directly uh, inversely proportional to the preservation so if it is anoxic environment preservation is a lot better than oxic environment right that is why most of these fossils you you find it from deep underneath the ocean bottom okay so uh, sea bottom now rate of burial that is again there is a very good factor that is uh, direct directly proportional to the preservation of fossils that if the burial is very fast where for example in the uh, uh, in the you know for example a, a, a landslide happens okay so that is exactly what happened in Uttarakhand right recently or many places in fact so this sort of landslide it is very fast burial okay there is no time left for scavenging or decomposition and in that case the fossilization is a lot more effective everything is preserved in the clear now uh, diagenesis or mineralization that is the same thing mineralization if if the if the mineralization happens faster then fossilization is also a lot more preserved the fossils are a lot more preserved if the if uh, mineralization happens a lot more faster then stratal erosion right or tectonic reworking all these factors erosion of strata means weathering right if some fossils are being weathered then of course there is not good fossils at all right so weathering or erosion should be minimal 
in order to fossils to be preserved better or tectonic reworking of strata so if it's in the uh, in the margins of the tectonic plates where uh, it's always under constraint then fossils are not really preserved well but if it's the center of tectonic plates then no issue with the preservation of these fossils so if you look at those very important fossil locations for example in australia or in canada or in china these are not in the margins of the tectonic plates but these are deep inside the tectonic plates where this sort of activities are reworking of strata are less common the clear then what is this lagger statin means uh, you know it is very important uh, window into past that this is a, a of course is a german word this means that the certain fossils were uh, soft body parts are well preserved okay so that is what uh, concentration lagger statin and conservation lagger statin in conservation lagger statin the the soft body parts are well preserved right so for example muscles of the organs are really preserved well so that it can really uh, give a lot more information than the normal fossils and another kinds of lagger statin is called concentration what is that certain places on planet earth this sort of thing like for example landslide happens right or at a time so if you go and check out there it is wonderfully preserved that time so lots of fossils all fossils are concentrated on one particular place that is that place is also known as lagger statin right these are some these lagger statins are the best places or best specimen for paleontologists okay so uh, example of Burgess Shale, this Burgess Shale in uh, British Columbia in Canada, that is uh, one of the famous spot for almost all of these paleontologists. Because if you go there, this particular place, you can see a lot of fossils of one particular, uh, you know, uh, geological time period preserved excellently. Okay, that is what it is. Now, bringing fossils to life, if you got a fossil then how do you analyze this fossil and what kind of meaningful conclusions that you can make out of a fossil discovery right uh, you can do comparative anatomy of fossils you can simply compare the different features for example comparative anatomy uh, one textbook example is what the uh, you know bone of your uh, forelimbs right of the mammal you can simply compare if it's a mammal you can compare the forelimb structure okay ulna radius uh, right uh, all those uh, humerus all those kind of bond structure you can simply compare one to one and to make conclusions about it you can also compare the length of it to draw the phylogenetic tree okay so that is what the comparative uh, anatomy of it then fossils can preserve ancient organisms behavioral patterns as well how these organisms are behaving for example it's theosaur okay it's a very old uh, uh, you know uh, reptiles you know ancient reptile which is extinct now right now you can see here this ichthyosaur uh, you know this is basically mostly reptiles are what oviparous oviparous means egg laying right but this ancient relative of this current day reptile or bird even birds and reptiles are sauropsid right so this one if you look at here unfortunately this diagram is not really clear if you see it here this is fossilized just during the birth so this sort of wonderful fossils you can find it out right this is like once in a lifetime opportunity if you find this kind of fossil then you are really luckier luckiest right this fossil is fossilized right on the time of delivery so this is a direct proof that ichthyosaur is a viviparous animal right so while current day reptiles and birds are all oviparous but the ancestor or MRCA okay the common ancestor of reptiles and birds are was a viviparous so that is what this particular specimen shows it and again this is fossilized right during the feeding you see that this is fish inside another fish right fish is engulfing a fish this sort of movements of the uh, you know organisms life is it's just like a uh, like a what a photograph right so that is what some of these fossils are so that actually if you look at these fossils that will show you the behavioral patterns of those animals during fossilization right 
and uh, you can also use a lot of techniques like math modeling mathematical modeling right or scanning electron microscopy or three dimensional ct scan even ct scan is used for mostly for medical imaging purposes but you can extend the ct scanning for uh, analyzing the fossils as well to further reveal the fossils features for example tyrannosaurus rex t-rex that is very 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 famous rex means king so king of all fossils because this is this was a carnivorous fossil a uh, carnivorous dinosaur okay so uh, if you analyze the leg muscle patches of course muscles you cannot find it you can only find the bones right preserved bones in the uh, fossils but you can see that bone where the muscle is actually the, you know you can see kind of a cavity or kind of uh, another other features of the muscle of the bone where the muscles are binding in and if you can see that uh, you know uh, uh, the, the density of this kind of uh, bone you can actually make uh, you know you can model the kind of muscle this must be having it and this kind of math modeling what they are doing uh, is that you know they are they are, they are uh, relating the muscle structure and muscle density with uh, how fast you can run of the current animal they make that kind of a correlation graph and then you are putting here this uh, t-rex whatever the factor which you found and then you are looking the speed of it are you getting the point they make a standard curve okay with the muscle shape for example or muscle uh, size for example and then with the speed so it could be directly proportional or something else okay that is what you call the model math model and then you find the t-rex where this one is fitting in if you know exact the place in the standard curve you know what the speed of the t-rex so they have concluded that T-Rex could not run fast, right? Those kind of modelings, uh, you know, it could be even dramatic modelling. You can perform it. For example, Jurassic Park. Have you seen that movie? So otherwise, you just go and see that, right? In this part of this evolution. So I think that would be fun to see that that movie. It's a very old movie, right? In fact, now you can also look at size, shape, and organization of melanosomes. Right, melanin producing uh, cells. Right, so if in the car carboniferous fossils, you can actually find this melanosomes of this particular, uh, you know, An Ancheornis huxley. So this particular, uh, you know, ancestor of birds, in fact. Right, so that helps scientists to reconstruct its striking plumage. For example, this is what it is. Right, so this fossil of this particular Ancheorni huxley. Right. So, if you take out the melanin of, of this melanosome of it and if you look at that melanosome and if you analyze the melanosome structure of the current birds for example and what is the, uh, you know, for example this kind of pattern equates this particular melanosome, right, then you can back calculate the kind of melanosome that this particular fossil is having what could have been the color of the plumage plumage is nothing but the feather the the kind of structure of the feather okay so then they have modeled that this is how the, it, it could have been looked like so those kind of uh, you know very interesting uh, you know back tracing or investigations of forensic analysis that is also part of paleontology okay then uh, uh, you know sound of hydrosa from the CT scans of skull, that is also a very interesting thing that this hydrosa, this sort of uh, uh, you know plant eating uh, dinosaur, right? So if you look at here, they have very funny this sort of skull, the extension of nostril, uh, you know nasal cavity. So what could be the use of this cavity? And they did analysis of this cavity through the CT scan, and uh, basically the you know the cochleal structure is directly proportional to the kind of frequency that is uh, being adapted to okay so each frequency have its own structural features of the cavity then they found that the uh, the frequency of uh, this particular dinosaur's voice is what the frequency of this particular structure is for okay so by that they have modeled and they found that this structure is for sound to create that particular sound and they could even come up with the com uh, 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 an absolute value of a frequency where this hydrosaur 
could have been produced that kind of sound that this hydrosaur dinosaur is producing in the past okay that's very excellent kind of study isn't it so those sort of studies also you can uh, do that or growth pattern of trilobites trilobite is uh, you know it used to be the most commonly found marine animal uh, around uh, you know 500 million years ago almost all of the planet earth's ocean was covered with trilobites trilobites are nothing but arthropods marine arthropods okay now if you look at here this trilobite is having a kind of a shield covering the head head part right there is a shield of it so how do this this trilobites grow for example how do human beings grow normally it grows till the age of for example uh, you know for 15 years 16 years and after that do you also increase your height not really you you know it becomes static right and your even your body shape everything is static after 20 years of initial growth right then in the, in the case of trilobite how is it so this one the you, you can get you can see a lot of fossils right you simply measure the size of this one right this is basically uh, you know you can see the length versus breadth okay so then you can see many many kinds of uh, trilobites right and you see that for example number 5 number 6 7 8 these are increasing in the size and how is this size increasing you simply plot it here length versus breadth or width here cephalic width cephalic length right the, you can see it's highly correlation is very high that as the length is high then width is also high so it grows in all the directions not just the length is getting higher so that kind of very interesting conclusions also you can come out from uh, fossil studies